So how did Lucifer's tail draw a third of the stars of heaven, casting them to the earth? Through lies and deception. Moses taking the serpent by the tail is a type of how the serpent's lies and deceptions will be revealed before the antitypical exodus. The lies begin in heaven, as we have seen, and his tail drew, drew the third part of the stars of heaven, that's the third part of the angels, and did cast them to the earth. He led them astray through lies and caused them to be destroyed, which they haven't yet, but eventually they will. And we'll see what's involved in that destruction. And the lies continued on earth and came to the Garden of Eden. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. And here is already a prophecy. The creeping things are the serpents. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree in the garden you may eat freely, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now the serpent was more subtle, more crafty, more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, has God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the tree, of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. For God knows that in the day that you eat of it, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So Adam and Eve had been made in the image of God. They had been made with a character of agape love. They had freedom of choice. They did not obey God out of a forced obedience. They served Him out of love. They were impartial. They were um, faithful to God out of love. They had the allegiance of love. They lived in perfect harmony. They were pure. They had no double-mindedness. And there was no mixture of light and darkness in their character. Now, when the serpent came in, it introduced the knowledge of good and evil. A merit and a merit system. A reward and punishment system. There was a mixture here of good and evil. A contrary duality. It was impure because it had a mixture. And it was volatile because it could go one way or the other. It brought in confusion and violence. And that takes us to Babylon. The word Babylon means confusion. Babel, that is Babylon, including Babylonian and the Babylonian Empire. The, the Babylon is a type of the kingdom of Satan that is mixed with this confusion of good and evil. So we're going to look at another antitype from Isaiah 14.4. You shall take this proverb against the king of Babylon, the king of confusion, and say, How has the oppressor ceased, the golden city ceased? So if we look at those two trees, you have the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The tree of life represents God's righteousness, his agape love, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil represents iniquity, Satan's system, 
Now, in the garden, every tree grew according to its own kind, except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It had a mixture. It had two types of fruit growing in it. God's tree of life is characterized by a singularity. It, it only has one fruit. It is unchanging. It's unconditional and it's predictable. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, on the contrary, has a contrary duality. It is changing. It can go back and forth. It is conditional and it brings confusion. And it has two types of fruit. And so if we were to characterize Satan's kingdom, he gives no freedom of choice because whether you get a fruit that is good or a fruit that is evil, both of them lead to death. The whole tree leads to death. There is no freedom of choice in death. There is a forced obedience there because if you don't obey, you'll be punished. You serve out of fear of punishment. There is partiality because now everything is based on merit or demerit. So you have the allegiance of fear, you have disharmony, and you have death. Now, I want to look at an ancient uh, philosopher, Pythagoras, mathematician as well, and how he thought about the number one. He characterized the number one as being divine, as expressing the divine, and the number two as being devilish. Speaking about uh, Pythagoras, there is um, Bepin Behari, who is a mystic, actually. He said this about what um, Pythagoras came up in terms of the two numbers. He said, the odd, that is the number one, the odd signs are reckoned as divine and, and the even signs, like number two, as terrestrial, devilish and unlucky. Only one is good and harmonious because no disharmony can proceed from one. And that's referring to God's agape love. It does not change. The even or binary numbers are different. The Pythagoreans hated binary. With them, it was the origin of differentiation, hence of contrast, of discord, the beginning of evil. With the Pythagoreans, the duad, that's the number two, was that imperfect state into which the first manifested being fell when it got, when it got detached from the monad. So we could say that the first manifested being, it would have probably in heaven have been Lucifer, the first created being, it would be more precise to say, or on earth, it would be Adam and Eve. So they entered into that imperfect state after they removed themselves from God's principle of unconditional love. It was the point from which the two roads, the good and the evil, the good in this case meaning agape, and the evil meaning good and evil, bifurcated. All that was double-faced, and that's good and evil, or false, was called binary by them. So we see the tree of life being one principle, unchanging, unconditional love, a divine part, pure and unmixed. Pure love, unmixed with evil. And that is something that God expressly talked about with the ancient Israelites. He um, gave them a few verses that were the most important verses. They were to speak those verses in the morning, afternoon, evening, before their children went to bed. It was extremely important. And they call it the Shema, which means, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. In Matthew, Jesus corroborated the Shema, and he said, when they asked him what's the most important commandment, and he said, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. 
We have the tree of the knowledge of good and evil being binary, having contrast, discord, and there you have the two types of fruit. A contrary duality, a double-faced false system. So we have to ask ourselves the question, why did God take the children of Israel out of Egypt? What does the Bible say? In Leviticus 11.45 it says, For I am the Lord that brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. So God wanted to take them out because they were not worshipping him in Egypt. They were worshipping other gods. And he wanted to bring them out so that he could be their God and so that they themselves should be holy just as God is holy. And if you look at the word holy, it's the word kadosh, kadosh in Hebrew. It means sacred. Um, but then if we look at the word where it came from, H6942, we'll see what it means. It means to be clean ceremonially or morally. And it also means to be pure, to be purified. So to be holy means to be ceremonially, physically or morally clean, to be pure without mixture. In Leviticus 18.3 it says, After the doings of the land of Egypt wherein you dwelt shall you not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, whither I bring you, shall you not do. Neither shall you walk in their ordinances. Now ordinances are laws. For they are, Leviticus 25.42, For they are my servants which I brought forth out of the land of Egypt. They shall not be sold as bondmen. These are the reasons why God brought them out of Egypt. But the Lord has taken you and brought you forth out of the iron furnace, even out of Egypt, to be unto him a people of inheritance as you are this day. So, here are the reasons why he took them out of Egypt. So God could be their God. So they could be holy and pure. So they could stop walking after the ordinances of Egypt, after their laws. So they would not be sold as bondmen and to make them a people of inheritance. And also to save them from the doctrines of devils. For all the gods of the people are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. And idols are good for nothing by analogy vain or vanity, Spe specifically an idol, no idol, no value, thing of naught. And we saw before that iniquity is nothingness as well. And in Joshua 24, 14, it says, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. And what one nation in the earth is like your people, even like Israel, whom God went to redeem for a people to himself, and to make him a name, and to do for you great things and terrible for your land before your people, which you, re which you redeemed to thee from Egypt, from the nations and their gods. And then in Psalm 81, 9, there shall be no strange god in you, neither shall you worship any strange god. I am the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt, Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it. But my people would not hearken to my voice, and Israel would none of me. So I gave them up unto their own heart's lust, and they walked in their own counsels. Oh, that my people had hearkened unto me, and Israel had walked in my ways. So Israel was walking in the way of the gods, following their ordinances and their laws.